So I'm not going to show you what happens after it gets into the blood. Uh, we'll be looking at that a little bit tomorrow in the acid alkaline balance. So let's begin with the mouth. Now the mouth is the only part of the gastrointestinal tract that we have say over. We have say over what goes in. Got that? We have say over the environment about when it's in. My husband's waving at me. What's tomorrow? Monday. What? <laughs> I know, tomorrow is uh, heart health and diabetes. Thank you, husband. <laughs> He's very faithful to give me the right information. <laughs> On Tuesday night, I'll be looking at acid alkaline and then the mind. Interesting, the gastrointestinal tract. Did you know that it's not part of you or me? Anything that goes in there is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny little substances absorbed through the gut wall and into the blood, then it becomes part of you and me. And the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And one writer called the, <coughs> the blood the river of life. So let's begin by looking at the mouth. So we have say over what goes in, we have say over when it goes in, whether it's every hour or whether it's just at meal times. We have say over how long it stays in the mouth. And you know that the teeth are there for a purpose. What is it? <clears throat> Actually, no. Chew, 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 chew. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we also have say over the environment that we are in when the food goes in. Because if it's a stressful environment, as you'll see as we go down, that can just stop digestion. So the food goes into the mouth and it's the only part of the body that we have exposed bone. What's the exposed bone? Teeth. Teeth. And it's very important to chew, 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 because when you chew things up, and you've probably heard the old saying, we should drink our food and chew our drinks. <laughs> So I say that to our guests at our health retreat because when they have their juices, it's good if they swill them around in their mouth a little bit before they swallow it. But when you chew your food up to tiny little particles, you now have a larger surface area for the enzymes to work on. And there are no teeth in the stomach. In other words, if you don't chew it there, let's say a nut, if there's any part of the nut that's not chewed to a creamy substance, that little lump of nut will go through your whole body, come out the other end, and you can never access the nutrients that are in that little lump of nut. So please chew. It always amazes me. It's such a, it's such a pleasant pastime. Why do we rush it? <laughs> it sure is pleasant. So the mouth is an alkaline environment and there's only one main food that's broken down in the mouth and that is starch. Now starch would be your pastas, potatoes, uh, bread, cereals and the enzyme that breaks down the starch is tylen. Now there is no tylen in a baby's mouth. The first teeth that a baby gets are four at the top, four at the bottom, and they're called milk teeth. You know why? That's all they should have, milk. But that's a very good taste time. That's when you give them a hunk of celery to suck away on. That's when you give them a hunk of apple to gum and weigh on. That's taste time. That's when you chew all the corn off a cob of corn and give them the rest. They love it, just the right size. They, that's taste time. Now, <coughs> when the next teeth appear, they're the molars. Now they can appear between 14 and 20 months of age. I met a baby a few days ago, 17 months of age and only had three teeth. Babies should have no starch until the molars are through because when the molars are through, then the, then the glands in the mouth start releasing tylen and tylen breaks down starch. Okay, mothers. What's the first food you were told to give your baby? 
Cereal. At what age? Three, four months. Six months. Did everyone hear that? Three, four, six months. Do you know that's where it starts? That's where malabsorption syndrome in the gut begins. And a mother says, my baby's not sleeping through the night. And so the baby health centre sister says, give her cereal at six o'clock. She'll sleep through the night. Sleep through the night, she's knocked out. She got this lump of glug. Uh huh. <laughs> I'll feed my baby in the night, thank you very much. I used to just sleep with my baby, stick them on when they woke and went back to sleep. So that's a very important point. You can go to my website, which is www.barbhealth.com and you can download an article called What Shall I Feed My Baby? Please download it and please give it to every mother you know because that's where a lot of the gut problems arise from, is babies being fed starch too young. www.barbhealth. B-A-R-B. Barb. It's my accent, isn't it? <laughs> Barb Health. Com. I'm just getting nods and shakes from my husband. <laughs> I'm not computer savvy, so he's got to help me on this one. That's the main digestion that happens in the mouth. That's why we should chew, chew, chew. The longer we chew it, the more it's broken down and the more Tylen can work on it. So what is, what is this 17-month-old little toddler that's walking around should eat? Just fruits and vegetables. Just fruits and vegetables and she still should be having her milk. And when the molars come, then you can start giving some starch. Do you know it's only in the last hundred years that they're feeding babies food? Huh? It's only this new phenomenon. And you look at most baby feeding brochures, who writes them? Uh, the baby food companies. What are they going to tell you? <laughs> you know, common sense is gone. A baby should not eat food till they can sit pick it up, feed themselves, and have got teeth to chew it. You know, there's been a death. No one attended the funeral. No one knew he died. It was the death of common sense. <laughs> Isn't that true? There's another food that's broken down in the mouth. Underneath the tongue, there are sublingual glands. And from the sublingual glands, lingual lipase is released. And lingual lipase is the enzyme that breaks down short and medium chain fatty acids which are found in your saturated fats. And the best saturated fat that we can eat is the coconut. It is a myth, a lie and a misconception that saturated fat is bad for you. Do you know some of the researchers that are showing the wonders of the coconut oil, the wonders of saturated fat, They've come to the conclusion it's going to take a whole nother generation to get people out of this fat phobia mentality. Isn't that incredible? Coconut is an amazing oil because if you've got gut problems further down, the coconut oil is excellent because the breakdown begins in the mouth. Now we come to stomach. Stomach is not an alkaline environment. Stomach is acid. And if someone says to me, I've got a very acid stomach, I say, fantastic. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> because it's only in an acid environment that the enzymes are released that break down protein. Did you know that that's the only food that is broken down in the stomach? Now, it's quite interesting how it happens. So the lining of our stomach are these big folds. And these folds are lined with glands. And two-thirds of those glands release mucus. Now that gives us a thick mucosa lining to protect. Now these glands down here release hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. Now hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen, they unite only in an acid environment to produce pepsin and pepsin breaks down protein. Now you can see why God didn't release pepsin there because you can, it'd start eating away at our stomach wall. 
The connection happens inside the stomach with the protection of that thick mucosa wall. So that's where protein digestion begins. One of the problems is there are a lot of people today in Australia and America who are eating their largest meal at the end of the day. Then they go to sleep. Let's look, let's look what happens to stomach when you're lying down. It's full of food. <laughs> What's getting pushed is this little valve. It's called the um, cardiac sphincter. It's there. There's actually two parts to it. And when it's weakened, the acid can come up. It's called reflux or heartburn. And it can be very uncomfortable to the point of um, ulcerating the esophagus. And so the person goes to the doctor. What does the doctor give them? And acid. What's going to break their protein down now? To give and acid is like shooting the horses because they keep all getting out of the gateway. Just shut the gate. Well, how do we shut the gate? Start eating breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, and tea, I mean supper. You say supper, don't you? Like a pauper. And sometimes paupers don't eat. Mm -hmm. So that when you go to bed, there's nothing in there or there's very little in there. And there's one more thing you can do. This cardiac sphincter is a muscle. And when it's relaxed, it's closed. And when it tightens, it opens. So if someone's stressed out, what's going to happen to that muscle? It'll open. What closes it? The ultimate muscle relaxant, which is magnesium. So if someone comes to me with reflux or heartburn, I put them on magnesium to relax that muscle. And they start having their main meal at breakfast and lunch. Is it that simple? It is. And there's something else I do. I give them bitter herbs to boost digestion. Because when the hydrochloric acid keeps getting killed, the body stops making so much. So what's happening to digestion now? You know what they're finding? Long-term antacid use is, calling col is causing colon cancer because food's getting down here that hasn't been broken down because the, acids, the acid environment is alkaline and these enzymes cannot work in an environment unless it's very acid. So it should be about 2.5 acidity. And if a person is eating all day long or drinking large amounts with their meal, what does that do? That brings it up to 3.5 or even 4. And these guys cannot work in that environment. We've had many people come off their antacids. One is Nexium and also those blockers that stop your body making so, making so much hydrochloric acid. What's going to break the protein down now? So how can we boost hydrochloric acid? How can we boost those enzymes? Well, one way to boost them is to have a break between meals. Digestion takes, and there's much research that, has, that supports this, three to four hours. And then your stomach loves a rest of one hour. So what's that? That's five to six hours between meals. And that's what Michael and I, uh, well, we have both done it for about 30 years now. We trained, a, well, we raised our children like that. And there's only one way you can do that, and that is to have a high fibre diet. And tomorrow night when I look at diabetes, I'll be defining the diet. So what's high fibre? Vegetables. Vegetables are your highest fibre. Generous amounts of protein. What's your protein? Chickpeas, lima beans, you call them garbanzos, yeah? Black-eyed beans, soy. Soy's okay as long as it's organic. 
nuts and seeds. We should be having a handful of nuts every meal. Nuts are high in vitamin B, excellent form of protein, excellent form of very usable fats. And healthy fats. What are your healthy fats? That's all your nuts, your seeds, your avocados, your coconuts. And olive oil and coconut oil. I'm not going to be defining fats in a lecture this week, but you can go to my YouTube. And, and also I've got my DVDs up the back and there's a lecture on fats where I show you the structure of them, the history of them. There's proof that they're excellent fats. You see, the membrane around every cell in the body is 50% fat. We can't access our fat-soluble vitamins unless we, we are eating it with fat. I don't suggest a cup of olive oil a day. <laughs> Concentrated food, just a little. And doesn't it make food taste nice? Yeah, our palate tells us. So these are the three food groups that keep the food in the stomach longer. These are the three food groups that will allow you to go that distance between meals. Now Dr. Kellogg, very famous doctor who wrote many books on health, he said a, a good way to boost digestion is to have about a quarter or a third of a cup of very hot water just before the meal. The hot water hitting the stomach stimulates the release of your digestive enzymes. Also, you can do some bitter tea. So instead of just hot water, you can make it a bitter tea. Now we have a tea we call digestive tea. It's affectionately called Dij tea. And it is one part licorice. It's one part dandelion. And it's one part gentian. Gentian is a very bitter herb. And it's the bitter herbs that stimulate those juices. And it's half a part of a herb that's called king of tonics to warm mucous membranes. I've already mentioned it, golden seal. Now what you do is you get all those herbs, you mix them together in a jar. And then you do one teaspoon of the herbs. And... <clears throat> one teaspoon of fresh ginger, which is a sweet bitter. And to that, you do two cups of water. And you do a gentle, gentle simmer. Ideally, you cook your herbs up in, uh, in glass, Pyrex. Try not to do metal. And then you take a third of a cup of that hot before every meal and that will boost your digestion. Psalm 104 verse 14, the Bible says, God gave herbs for the service of man. They are there to work with you. I had a lady ring me. She said, I've been on digestive enzymes for five years. I've been on this digestive tea for one month and I'm getting better results <laughs> because these herbs are working with the body. And that, those herbs restore, revive, regenerate gut function. And many people who have reflux have it because they're not digesting their food properly. And it starts to ferment and the gases come up and then they're given what? An acid. Whoa. Like shooting all the horses. You shut the gate. And a man came to me, he'd been on antacids for 25 years. Is it working? No, no, no. We're going to look after poor old stomach. And to look after poor old stomach, you eat breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen, <coughs> supper like a pauper. And you don't eat with your meals because that will water down your digestive enzymes. You don't drink with your meals. So you stop drinking half an hour before the meal and you resume drinking about an hour and a half, two hours after the meal. Now we come to the duodenum. The duodenum 
is the first part of the small intestine. So that's down here. And that's your pyloric sphincter, the bottom valve. Now look here, we've got the neck of the pancreas coming in. But what we've also got is that's the liver, that's the gallbladder, and the bile duct comes down behind and it connects with the neck of the pancreas at a very important spot called the ampule of vata. I had to memorize that one, it was such an interesting name. But that's what happens. Now, so you've got a whole lot of enzymes coming in from this direction here. So in the duodenum, we've got some, we've got um, from the gallbladder, we'll just pull it GB, is bile. Now bile has one role in the body and that is to break down fat. And it emulsifies the fat down into tiny particles. But, see the saturated fat, the breakdown starts in the stomach. Sorry, mouth. But here, the bile is breaking down polyunsaturated fats. They're your long chain fatty acids. So what are your polyunsaturated fats? They're found in your nuts and your seeds, most of those foods. What you've also got happening in the duodenum is pancreatic lipase. Now pancreatic lipase, polyunsaturated fats, pancreatic lipase comes in and further breaks down the polyunsaturated fats. What you've also got coming out of the pancreas is pancreatic amylase. Now, tylen is an amylase and it breaks down... Sorry, they should be over in the middle pile, shouldn't they? So we've got pancreatic, this is from the pancreas. Pancreatic lipase, helping to break down the polyunsaturated fats. From the pancreas, we've got pancreatic amylase. And that's doing the final breakdown of your starch. Now remember the starch started in the mouth. It was put on hold in the stomach. And then it comes down to the duodenum, which is once again alkaline. So the only acid part of our body should be the stomach. What you've also got coming from the pancreas is trypsin. Now trypsin is an enzyme that does the final breakdown of protein. But from the pancreas, you've also got chymotrypsin, which also breaks down protein. So let me just show you starch. Starch starts in the mouth in an alkaline environment, is put on hold in the stomach. When it gets down to the duodenum, pancreatic amylase does the final breakdown of the starch. Fats. Your saturated fats start in the mouth with lingual lipase and they don't need anything else worked on them. That's why they're an amazing fat. Whereas your polyunsaturated fats, your sunflower, your olive oil, your um, almond oil, all your seeds and nuts, that does not get worked on until it gets into the duodenum, bile from the gallbladder, emulsifies it down to tiny particles, pancreatic lipase further breaks it down. Protein, the digestion starts in the stomach. Let me show you. This is protein. That's protein. In the stomach, under the action of pepsin, did we write pepsin? We didn't. Under the action of pepsin, that protein's broken down to polypeptides and peptides. You've probably heard those terms. 
And then it comes down to the duodenum and trypsin and chymotrypsin break the polypeptides down to an amino acid and peptide, the peptides down to amino acids, and then further down to the peptide to amino acids. And it's only as the singular structure that it can be absorbed into the blood. So even though they're long names, they, once you break down the meaning of those words, it's actually not that hard. So you can see that by the time we get down to the first part of the small intestine, most of the breakdown has happened or should have happened. But can you see if a person's having antacids, then the protein doesn't get broken down to polypeptides and peptides. Mm. And all trypsin and chymotrypsin can often do is, make, is, is bring it down to polypeptides and peptides. It can't even bring it down to amino acids. And so the protein, which should have been already absorbed before it gets to the large part of the small intestines, getting down to the large intestine, bacteria has to be produced to try and cope with it by the time it gets out of your body, and that can create a lot of bad wind. You've heard of bad wind? Flatulence? <laughs> right. And that bacteria can also start to eat holes in the colon wall. There's your colon cancer for after long use antacids. There's a Proverbs, Proverbs 14 verse 6. It says, knowledge is easy to him that understands. When you understand what's happening in your gut, you start to have the knowledge on how to treat your gut, your digestion. Most of your nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. So what we're coming to now is the grand finale of digestion. Your small intestine is lined with villi, like this. Remember we just briefly touched on it? And the, new, the little cells are remade every three to five days. They travel up and then away they go. Every three to five days this process happens. When we were in utero, there was no gut flora in our gut. When we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microbes. Now, last year in Australia, they did a show called The Gut Reaction, and they had a obstetrician on there, and he said, I always thought God made a mistake, putting the birth canal and the anus so close. Because when baby comes out, you don't want that baby to go anywhere near what's coming out the other hole. And you know what they used to do? They used to give women enemas and try and, and I've got the nurse over here nodding her head madly. Yeah, and clean that up. He said, we now know it's a perfect design. Isn't that incredible? Because when baby comes down the birth canal and the birth canal stretches open, what also stretches open is that little canal next door and when baby's face hits the air, baby goes, ah! and what's that air laden with? <laughs> all the bacteria, all the microbes from the, from the mother's gut. And that is, notice what the obstetrician said, a perfect design. Because as that baby, baby breathes in the microbes, those microbes line the gut like a thick turf wall. And the microbes in the gut are where the grand finale of digestion happens. And did you know that for the first three days, our lady's breast just releases a thick, creamy substance called colostrum? It's got microbes in it, and you probably know it's a very important part of building up baby's immune system. Do you know why our immune system is built on the microbes? Huh? We've got to look again at the microbes. <laughs> they have found babies born via cesarean section have a gut lined with skin bacteria. Because what's their first breath? Skin bacteria. 
and they have found babies born via cesarean section are more prone to allergies, more prone to gut problems. So if a mother does give birth to a baby via cesarean section, that mother should paint her nipple every morning with some probiotic powder so the baby is starting to get the, uh, the good bacteria. Now, it's not for three days that the milk comes in. So on the third day, do you know I got an email from a man two weeks ago. He said, Barbara, my, my, my wife just gave birth to a baby three, three days ago and she's got no milk and they're wanting to give the baby formula. I wrote back and I said, but there's no milk for three days. Surely there's someone in that maternity unit who knows that. Have mercy. <laughs> Is it because so many women are bottle feeding? I said, by the time you get this email, it'll be coming in. He wrote back the next night, he said, it's in. <laughs> it's in. That's all that little immature gut can handle in those first three days. Is that colostrum? Mm -hmm. Very important. In fact, if a calf doesn't get the first three days of its mother's colostrum, that's a very weakly calf. And the farmer knows. He, puts, he tries to get that calf on very early because he knows the importance of that colostrum. Now, what are these guts? What, what are these microbes lining the gut? What's their role? They are vital for the final breakdown the final breakdown of our food. They are responsible for the absorption of our food. Remember what I said, grand finale. They are responsible for protection. They protect our blood from any harmful pathogens that make that may come down that gut and they are responsible for nourishing the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. So if you've got a breakdown in those microbes, you've got a compromise in the breakdown of the food, the final. You've got a compromise in the absorption of our food. You've got a compromise in the protection. You've got a compromise in nourishing these little cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. Michael and I just went through border security. We had to take our shoes off, our boots off, our belts off. Whoa, they're strict and it's important. How much more important is your border protection? Here's your border protection. Well, what would break that down? Antibiotics kill it off. Antibiotics just come in and say, I've got a job to do and I'm going to kill no matter who you are, no matter what colour your skin and no matter what your name. <laughs> Statin drugs. Did you know that cholesterol causing heart disease is a total myth? And I'm going to show you tomorrow night. And I've got quite a few important cardiologists to back me up. They won't be here in person, but I'll give you their names. From Russia, from Sweden, from Australia, from Britain, from America. Cardiologists showing that cholesterol does not cause heart disease. And those cholesterol-lowering medications can knock off the flora. Cortisone. All your prednisones. Uh, Pain-killing drugs, contraceptive pill. You know, I've had a few, a few phone calls in this last year from mothers. They're in their last trimester of pregnancy. They've had a urine test and the doctor said, you've got strep B. Do you know it's the latest thing, strep B? You have to take an antibiotic, otherwise when you give birth to your baby, your baby might get strep B and die. It's a lie. Well, the pharmaceutical companies is going to get a little bit more money out of you as you take that antibiotic. And as the mother takes the antibiotic, 
you know, she's going to cause an even worse problem because if the mother has a compromised gut flora, when she gives birth to the baby, what does the baby get? Compromised gut flora. And at two days of age, sometimes one day of age, they're given strep, no, back, hepatitis B vaccine. What's the hepatitis B vaccine for? For drug addicts and prostitutes. One doctor said, I'm not going to vaccinate my baby because my newborn baby is not a drug addict or a prostitute. You can say no. We just had a lady come and her grandson was given the hep, the, uh, hep B. For the first six months of that baby's life, he had to be fed with an Ig tube. Perfect at birth after the vaccine, then the swallowing action was lost. When that vaccine came in, a further blow. And then the mother can't feed, so she gives altered cow's milk, warmed up in a microwave, in a plastic bottle. It's painful, isn't it? And the baby cries a lot. And the ad on the television says, baby, Panadol's all right. <coughs> further blow. Then at four months, the, baby's, the mother's told the baby must have cereal. Mm, further blow. And then the baby's vaccinated again. Do you know that at the four-month vaccine, many mothers have said to me, after the four-month vaccine, the lights went out in my baby's eyes. Just tragic. One baby dies every three years from whooping cough. Hundreds die every year from the vaccine. You will never read that. It's scary, isn't it? So you can see what's happening to our poor gut flora. Hmm? Let me show you more. The wheat in America and Australia today has been hybridised. It was hybridised in the 50s, went worldwide in the 70s. So by the 1990s, every pretzel, every bread, every cereal, every pasta, every donut, you call them cookies, we call them biscuits, hybridised wheat. When that hybridised wheat breaks down in the gut, it breaks down to gluto, morphine. What's morphine? It's an opiate derivative. And it looks like this. This is just for purposes of illustration. Gluto, morphine. Now this cell here, remade every three to five days, is a very unhappy cell. No gut flora. This cell here is a very happy cell because he's got gut flora. When glutomorphine comes through here, that very happy cell has the ability to knock off the morphine so only gluto gets through. When glutomorphine comes to the unhappy cell that's not being nourished, it has no ability to knock off the glutomorphine so glutomorphine gets in. Dr. David Pertmuller, a neuroscience scientist who wrote Grain Brain. He shows, he's got a few examples from different psychiatrists, they stopped their um, bipolar schizophrenic patients having wheat, 50% improvement. See, it's not just the wheat, it's also the gut flora. And there's another book called Gut and Psychology by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride. You might have heard of the FODMAC diet. They're all on basically the same thing. It's this hybridised wheat and the compromised gut flora. You see the problem that's happening? Dr. Um, mm. Guy, he was a um, British um, gastroenterologist. And he found a lot of the children coming to him with gut problems were also autistic. He did uh, biopsies on the payers patches, which is the, the uh, transverse colon, and he found MMR vaccine in their payers patches. He wrote an article in The Lancet with a slight implication to, is it the gut, the autism, and the MMR vaccine? The pharmaceutical company did a, did a witch hunt on him, Dr. Andrew Wakefield. Wakefield, lost his credentials, lost his job, had to leave the country. Can you believe it? 
He's written a book called Callous Disregard. That's the name of his book because of the callous disregard on, the, on medicine not to acknowledge what... He, he, it wasn't just him. He was the head of a whole team of pathologists. Just tragic. What are they scared of? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm afraid that's it. So how can we heal that gut? And how do you know if that gut's not working? It will tell you. Your body will speak to you. And irritable bowel syndrome, gastritis, Crohn's disease, they are all colitis. It's all that that gut lining is raw and not working. And there's a very simple remedy. Do you know why it's so simple? Because the cells that line the gut are remade every three to five days. Number one. There are two herbs that coat, soothe and heal the lining of the gut. One is slippery on. Called slippery on because when you wet, put water with it, it gets quite slippery. The lining of our gut looks like the inside of your lip. Mm -hmm. And slippery on is a little bit slimy. It coats, soothes and heals that lining. There is a trick to mixing it. You put boiling water in the powder and mix it quickly and it goes smooth, then a little bit of cold water in so you can drink it. Drink it quick before it goes too thick. It has a growth stimulant in it and it stimulates rapid healing in the lining of the gut. Isn't God good? Psalm 104 verse 14, he gave herbs for the service of man. And aloe vera. That slimy aloe vera is a perfect lining for the gut. Now you must peel it because the yellow slime just under the skin will give the person diarrhea and if they've got irritable bowel, you don't want them to have that. So just the clear gel in the middle. Or you can buy aloe vera juice. I suggest if someone has colitis or irritable bowel or a Crohn's disease, they do a week of slippery elm, then a week of aloe vera, then a week of slippery elm. Because very sensitive guts, they, they get used to things very easily. Some people say to me, I ate one meal and it was fantastic. I ate it for three days and the fourth day it wasn't fantastic. You've almost got to find, say, four or five meals that sit well and alternate them. Stop. There are three foods that must stop because they irritate the gut. One is the wheat. Can you get... Original wheat. Do you remember people from the, who were born probably before the 50s when wheat was that high? That's the original, they call it ancient grains now. The new wheat is this high. They had to do it that high because they did it to get a high yield. And if it stayed this high, the stalk breaks because the yield is so heavy. So stop the wheat, stop the dairy. Remember, it's dairy. Cow's milk's excellent milk for baby calves, but if you give a newborn calf the milk that's in the supermarket, the calf will die. Scary. Someone said, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned. I eat food. <laughs> you see, milk's for babies. <laughs> and refined sugar. See, one of the problems is we've got an imbalance in the microbes. One lady said, I've got candida. I said, congratulations, we all have. It's only when it's out of control that it's a problem. And when the lactobacillus acidophil is killed off, then the candida can get out of control. And this will feed it. Number three, flood the gastrointestinal tract with the good guys, the probiotics. Bring back the balance. Let me give you a story of a lady that came to a lecture I gave on the gut when I was in New Zealand, say six months ago, on irritable bowel. She heard this lecture. She came up to me afterwards. She said, I've had irritable bowel syndrome for 40 years. She said, I still have pain and cramping. I'm still bleeding from the bowel. On medication, did you hear that? Going eight times a day to the toilet. You know, three intakes should equal three evacuations. She said, what you've told me tonight, I have never heard. She went home and she immediately implemented that. 
Thursday night she came up to me with a smile. She said, the bleeding has stopped. I have no more cramps in my stomach and I'm going four times. You know, by Saturday she was going three times. Your body will talk to you. If it's working, it'll tell you. If it's not working, it'll tell you. That's why I think everyone should be their own doctor because only you know how you feel, only you know what you've been through and only you know how your body reacts or responds to different things. How quickly she responded. She's not better yet. She's not healed, but she's on the road. On the road. On the road. Isn't that good news? Is it that simple? We can thank our Heavenly Father, it is. <laughs> I have so many stories. We had a guy come about one month ago. He was on anti-inflammatories, cortisone, had been for many years. On his morning walk, he walked by the beach because he knew there were lots of toilets along the beach. Because <laughs> he'd have to go three times just on his morning walk. And his favourite food was... Bread every meal, love cheese. Cheese is very nasty on the gut. And he had a couple of scotches every night and a couple of coffees in the day. And when he heard this, he went, whoa. <laughs> I was giving him slippery elm three times, well, three times a day, morning, noon, evening, and just before bed. By the third morning, he could... He could go on the morning walk without having to uh, find the bathroom. So by Wednesday, he decided to stop his medication. Good place to do it at the health retreat. We're watching you. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> we don't serve any wheat, dairy or refined sugar at our health retreat. <laughs> He was a bit cautious at first. He only came to our health retreat because his wife wanted to come. By the end of the week, he said to me, I'm excited. He said, two weeks before I came to you, I, I went to the doctor for a checkup, and the doctor said, we cannot help you anymore. Hmm? He was on all that medication, and he still wasn't getting the results. He said, you know what's incredible by the end of the week? He said, I had this constant pain that I'd almost just learnt to live with. He said, it's gone. Now, it was a bit hard when he first heard it because he loved his bread and he loved his scotch every night. But by the end of the week, because he was getting such amazing responses, he was happy to stop the scotch <laughs> and to stop the bread. Isn't that good news? What if you've got the other problem and you can't go? That's another problem. Constipation, it's called. Did you hear what I said a few minutes ago? Dr. Kellogg said three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. Now, let me, before I go to the large colon, let me just talk about the appendix. Did you know that God didn't make a mistake? He never does. The appendix has th two main functions. One, it is called the colon's oil can. Because what it does, it lubricate what comes into here to help it move through. And it also releases antibacterial fluid. Because with some people, especially people on a high meat, high sugar diet, we've got putrefaction as it comes out here. And it's pretty toxic. You see, a dog can eat meat because it's in and out. Six foot track. We've got an eight metre long track. So this appendix, when it's pretty toxic, what's coming out of here, it releases antibacterial fluid to try and calm it down as it moves through your body. Meat is very dangerous for this gut because it has no fibre and it can get caught up in here, up in here, up in here, and it can start to rot. You know, countries in this world that have always been vegetarian never heard of colon cancer. They start to eat meat, refined sugar, all the refined grains, and their incidence of colon cam cancer comes immediately up to the industrialised nations. 
One of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed, so it can be passed with ease. If someone is dehydrated, more water gets taken out than should be taken out. What are we left with? Uh, rabbit pellets, uh, cement. Now I want to tell you something about an interesting little muscle called pubo rectalis. And we've all got pubo rectalis. And pubo rectalis is a little, mu little muscle that holds this part up. It's like a little, so we'll rub that out. Can you see what it does? And we're very glad for pubo rectalis because if it wasn't for pubo rectalis, we would be more prone to actually release what's in there if we <coughs> laughed or coughed. Got that? <laughs> now, pubo rectalis, it's just holding that area up. And when we sit, to go to the bathroom, puborectalis continues its hold. But when we squat, okay, to go to the bathroom like they do in many uh, primitive countries, puborectalis releases. And instead of being held up, it goes like this. Can you see how it opens that? Now I've got some good news. You don't have to go out to the backyard and squat under a tree. You can buy Squatty Potty. <laughs> <laughs> and Squatty Potty sits around your toilet and allows you to have your knees up, releasing puborectalis when you evacuate. And that can be incredibly helpful for people who are prone to constipation because if puborectalis holds its, and you can see why it's doing it, and obviously it's still letting things through, and a lot of people can't get it through, so they strain, and then these horrible little things pop out. And they're so horrible, we're gonna rub them right out again. <laughs> called Hemorrhoids. <laughs> now we human beings have a muscle. It's our pelvic girdle. What's a girdle? Holds it in tight. And this, this pelvic girdle starts at our belly button, goes right round and under and basically is linked to our lower spine. And many people in the latter years of life lose pelvic girdle strength and they are incontinent urinary. For women, they often get uh, prolapses of the vagina, and in both men and women, you can get incontinence with their fecal. Not, not a happy situation to be in. So it's very important to keep your pelvic girdle strong <coughs> and squatty potty with your knees up strengthens that pelvic girdle and you don't have to strain. All straining does, it does not strengthen pelvic girdle. It just puts so much pressure on here, it weakens it to the point where hemorrhoids can come out and they're incredibly painful. When I worked as an operating theatre nurse, we used to do some hemorrhoidectomies. Oh dear. I used to think, that poor person, how will they feel when they wake up? Nothing compared to how they'll feel when they first go to the toilet. And no one tells them about squatty body. So imagine the pressure that's on there. So to keep this colon working well, it's important to squat when you go to the bathroom. Now if you can't afford squatty potty, you can buy a little stool for a dollar from the dollar shop and just have your feet up there. One lady that started to use Squatty Potty, she said to me a couple of things are happening. I only ever used to go once a day, now I'm going twice. She said to me, I sit and I think I haven't really gone and I have a look in there and I certainly have gone. And you can see why she feels that way because this is totally opened up. 
So never forget your pubo rectalis. It's a little muscle that we're very glad of that holds that up. But when you squat pubo rectalis, the muscle releases, opens that basic sigmoid rectum part of the colon and just allows it to come out easier. And in many countries, especially if, when I've been in uh, Africa, you go into the toilet and it's a hole on the floor. <laughs> it's all very clean and ceramic. <laughs> very important too that we practice squatting. If you can't squat, just, you know, squat to pick things up. Um, squat against a wall. And have you noticed how toddlers pick things up, little little toddler. This is how they, they put their feet apart and they go like that and they lift up like that. How do many humans lift? And you know what? Where all the weight is taken there and that causes the weak backs. But when we squat, do you know where the weight's taken? Biggest bone in the body, which is your femur and biggest muscle mass in the body, which is your quads. How many people do you know with bad backs? And you know, part of the problem is the weak pelvic girdle. Okay, so strengthen that pelvic girdle by squatting. Make sure that back's straight when you bend and use your biggest muscle mass, your quads and your biggest bones to lift and you will protect your back. So how do we get the colon moving properly? Squat, open puborectalis, make sure that you are eating fibre. What's the most fibre? Most fibre is found in your vegetables, some fruits. Fruits are high in fibre but they're also high in sugar and as you'll find out tomorrow night when I look at diabetes, you're best to go more vegetables, some fruits and all your whole grains have got your fibre. And because the colon, one of the colon's main function is to take water out, it's very important to keep well hydrated. And tomorrow night I'll be showing in detail how to, to properly hydrate the body. And exercise, exercise every day. Are you familiar with Pilates exercises? They're all core strengthening exercises and pelvic floor strengthening exercises. So very important to to uh, do this to the human body every day. You see, we're training for something more important than the Olympic Games. As my lecture comes to a close, we can now open the floor for questions. So what I'll do for the sake of the recording and for the sake of you, when a question is asked, I'll repeat it. Yes? Um, I have a question regarding um, the overgrowth of candida and black fever. Do you think that that is kind of an antagonist? Okay, the question is if there's an overgrowth of candida in the colon, does flax meal antagonise that? No, it does not at all. In fact, it can't because when you think about it, you're, um, it's mostly fed by sugar and flax meal is very low sugar. But with flax meal, it must be freshly ground because the omega-3s in the flax meal deteriorate within one hour of grinding. Now, now, if ever you get bloated, bloated when you have a food, what you look at is maybe it's the combination. So maybe when it's in com combination with something else. And if it does bloat, you just don't have it. You can get omega-3 in, uh, um, in um, walnuts and you can get omega-3 in the chia seeds. Yes? Okay, ringing in the ears, one of the most causes of ringing in the ear is the hybridised wheat and dairy because they are both really not handled by the body, so the body creates all this mucus. And we've got eustachian tubes in our head, which is tubes to our ear, tubes, sinus, nose, mouth, eyes. They're all connected. And so often when a person has is not handling the wheat and dairy, the mucus builds up. That's one of the main causes of sleep apnea 
It's one of the main causes of sinus problems. It's one of the main causes of tinnitus or ringing in the ear, ear infections. All of those things happen. The tubes aren't clear. So, and you can have a slice of bread and it'll be out of your body in 24 hours. But the effect can remain for two months. Did everyone get that? It can take two months for the effect to get out of the body. So you might have nothing for a month, have a slice of bread, guess what? You're back to square one. <laughs> yes? Can we consume the organic wheat like a sprout while we are speaking? Or okay, now your organic wheat, your organic wheat is still hybridized, but if you sprout it, you, you can bring it back to a plant. So the two dangers of organic wheat is the gluten structure, which I'll be showing you in detail on Tuesday night, and tomorrow night I'll be showing you what that hybridized wheat the hybridization is done to the starch. So when you sprout it, you break down the sugars, the starches, and you break down the gluten. So if you've just bought a lot of wheat, you could sprout it. <laughs> I, put, I put it in the food processor, and then I put it in the dehydrator, and I scrap it. Yep. It's really sweet. Yes, if you... When you bring it back to a plant, you're actually breaking down the sugars, you're breaking down the starches. So sprouting it, you know, and blending it, putting it in the dehydrator, yeah, that's what, you, if you've just bought wheat, that's what you do with it. <laughs> there is a question, yeah? How would one compensate for the functioning of your appendix if you had an appendectomy? Appendectomy, appendix, yeah. You know, the body's the most amazing organism in its ability to do, adapt and adjust. And so if you have had your appendix out, your body does compensate, but you would have to be particularly careful because most people that have had their appendix out are prone to constipation. So you just eat very, very well and, and your body does adapt, yes? Hi, could you uh, talk a little bit more about the interaction of, uh, of coconut oil and diabetics? Um, yeah. Now, it, it has been said in some circles that the saturated fats are contributing to diabetes, and in some circles it has been said that the polyunsaturated... The only time polyunsaturated fat is a problem is if it's been exposed to heat, which like in your margarines have. So that's why you should not touch any oil unless it's cold-pressed... Uh, um, olive oil, because it does have a double bond that can be destroyed. But the coconut, it does not affect diabetes. In fact, it can turn diabetes around. Now, Dr. Bruce Fife has written five books. His name's F-I-F-E. In fact, I just saw a sixth book the other day, which has recipes for the using coconut flour instead of wheat flour. There is a difference, but the same treatment can turn them around. And tomorrow night I'll be defining that in detail. And most people are unaware of how the hybridised wheat is one of the biggest contributing factors to diabetes we're seeing today. Have I answered enough? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, so um, to alleviate abdominal pains, especially when stressed, you know, my husband is very black and white and whenever he gets a discomfort, he sits down and he assesses his last 24 hours. I think it's, it's very simple, but it's a very good idea. So if the pain is there, you would assess what, what, what has happened. Is it something you've eaten? Um, if you're very stressed... Um, that stops your digestion somewhat. So if you're hungry and stressed, you're better to make a protein smoothie that's not going to take much digestion. Yeah? I have a question about the duality. You mentioned that yeah. you have to digest food. Yeah. Um, what if that probiotic can be done? So when a baby has had C-section, and what can they do when they have allergies? Do you know there's only three main allergens? 
and that is refined sugar, wheat and dairy. I've had people come to me and they've said, since I've stopped the wheat, dairy, refined sugar, I don't have a dust mite allergy anymore. I don't have a cat allergy anymore. I don't have a horse allergy anymore. These are different people with different allergies. So to repair the gut, it was, it's basically the, what I just said there is the aloe vera or the slippery elm, stopping the foods that do it. Do you know, the day does come when the gut is strong enough and maybe the person can have a slice of <laughs> wheat bread now and then or go out to an Italian restaurant and have a... Um, but until the healing happens, they, they don't. It's like the baby in the nursery. You don't subject the baby in the nursery to a whole lot of things that, you'd have, that a two-year-old would be subjected to. You, until healing happens, you've got to be very strict. There was a question there, yeah? There is a reason for the hypothyroidism. There's a few reasons. High estrogen opposes thyroid function, and I must tell you, we're seeing it in Australia. So women that were on the pill in their teens and 20s, and what pill does, it gets the estrogen up very high. But it stays imbalanced, and then eventually it starts to affect the thyroid. So that's number one, is the pill. So any any person with a thyroid problem should go on a hormone balancing cream. Number two is the thyroid needs selenium to convert iodine into thyroxine. And mercury fillings in the mouth have an affinity for selenium. So the mercury fillings have to come out. And how many people think fish and salad is a really healthy lunch, but fish today are high in mercury? So... The other thing is low iodine. And there is a way you can do the iodine. It's a very simple way. You buy Lugol solution, L-U-G-O-L-S. Lugol solution is a combination of iodine and iodide. And you put one drop on your skin and it'll make a brown smudge. And that brown smudge should still be there five hours later. If it is, your iodine levels are good. If it goes in an hour, your iodine levels are low because the body gobbled it all up. What's, what's, the, what's the remedy? Just put it there every day till it stays there. How simple is that? So can you see with thyroid, you've got to address mercury, you've got to address hormones, and you've also got to address the iodine. What cream would you suggest? Well... Yeah, Anna's Wild Yam Cream. If you go to my website, you, you can, uh, you can, or well, not even my website, just do Barbara O'Neill Hormones and you'll get the hormone lecture. Anna's Wild Yam Cream. It's an Australian cream, but you can get it in America. And it stimulates the body to make more progesterone. And, and as the lecture shows, when you get the progesterone up, it'll get the estrogen down. Yes? Um, uh, I have a question about candida overgrowth. I'm dealing with a many, many symptoms of that. Would you, is that like a natural Because I know that oil of oregano works, but it also kills off the good bacteria and the apple cider vinegar is really strong. So okay, that's a good question. What do you do for candida overgrowth? I am not aware of oregano oil killing off good bacteria. That's what I was told by my doctor. Oh, okay. <laughs> Did you ask him what antibiotics do? <laughs> now, in my book, I talk about the uh, conquering the candida overgrowth. So basically, in my last lecture, what... You've got to starve. So anything with yeast, anything with refined sugar, even fruit. I advocate just Granny Smith apples or grapefruit for a while. And alternate the herbs. You might do grapefruit seed extract one week. You might do oregano oil another week. You might do garlic another week. Because the body gets used to things and so do the microbes. Yeah, yeah. So, so what it's good to do, don't do them all at once, then you've got no ammunition up your sleeve. Yeah. You just alternate them. Yeah. And depending on how long it's been happening in the body as to how long it takes before 
it, it is eradicated. One lady said she got rid of it in three weeks, another lady said it took her 18 months. So, so, and you also have to check that you have no exposure to mould, that's important. Question there? There is a lot of probiotics on the market and some of them say, we have 50 trillion, oh no, we have 60 trillion and billion, whatever. Um, Lactobacillus acidophilus are the two permanent bacteria in the gut and from those two, all the others are made. So you don't have to get one that's got trillions of different types. But what I would go for is a, um, a vegetarian one. Now we have one and it's basically just Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium, 5 billion acidophilus, 5 billion acidophilus, sorry I did that one, and 5 billion bifidum in a quarter of a teaspoon. So it's a nice strong dose. So you really just have to, um, and I know you can't get that, but it's just an illustration of the one I use. It's from a vegetarian source. And you can do water kefirs, you can do coconut milk or... Soy milk kefirs, you can do incorporate sauerkraut, incorporate the sourdough breads, incorporate um, miso. So, but if you've got an, uh, if you really want to boost it, if someone's been on antibiotics, they should go on large dose probiotic for at least a couple of months. It can take that long to bring it back. Yes? How do you keep a C section baby healthy? How do you keep a C section baby healthy? Um, Ideally breastfed, ideally the mother does not eat any wheat, dairy or refined sugar and the mother puts a little bit of probiotic on her nipple and when the baby has teeth and starts eating, make sure that cultured foods are incorporated in that and uh, the, ba the baby will go well. Yeah? How old's the baby? Seven. Yep, you can do all that with the seven-year-old. They're eating a full thing. Yeah? Uh, you see, you don't have to buy baby one, you just do half dose of adult dose. That's fine, yes? Um, I have a question. Um, I had a thyroid issue and I was terminated with some T cells. I need copper now, so I'm wondering what that is. Yeah. Can I get off of T cells and then go? I have seen people get off the medication, but it's important first to implement everything I have, have advised. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's mercury fillings in the mouth, it's one thing them to get them out, but another thing to detox from the mercury. You call it cilantro. We, we call it fresh coriander and chlorella, C-H-L-O-R-E-L-L-A. -L -L They're both metal chelators. So it's important to get everything in place before you consider um, stopping the medication. Yeah? Yeah, the yogurt is good, but if someone is looking at conquering candida or, or recovering from antibiotic, they really need to take the high dose. The cultured foods can maintain it, but initially you'll need a blast. I've got a lady up there. Yeah? Yes. Um, if, if you have uh, um, issues with um, sensitivity in the hand and sensitivity in the palm and the hand, sensitivity in the palm I'd, I'd need to investigate to find out why these things are so. Sometimes that's a side effect of chemotherapy um, and sometimes it can be uh, spine. Uh, you, you'd have to investigate where it all started. But exercise is very, very important. And the other thing, the hands must be kept warm and you can wrap the hands at night in a cloth that's had a little bit of oil put on it, lots of cayenne pepper, wrap the cloth up. And and then, you know, band, plastic then bandage and then that, that, that can really wake the nerves and the, and the blood up. Yes? Yes, you mentioned dairy and you talked about milk and you talked about cheese. What about eggs? What about eggs? Do you know, I leave that up to the person. Some people have come to me and said, Barbara, we've got the healthiest chooks, we give them organic grain, we love our eggs. I say, eat eggs. <laughs> I leave it to the person. Michael and I hardly ever eat an egg. 
In fact, someone gave us a dozen organic eggs and they just sat in the fridge for six months because we're not that keen. So it's something that I'll leave up to the person. But sometimes we have people come to our health retreat. We'll have a, a guy, I was going to say bloke. You don't call him bloke, a man. <laughs> He's a bachelor. And when I say to him, organic eggs, he's greatly relieved because that's easy. <laughs> so I really leave it up to the person. Yeah? What about lactose-free milk? I'm afraid I don't touch anything from the cow. You know, it's for the cows. And again, we don't need milk because we've got teeth and we eat food. Yeah? Yeah. Every day of his life until he was 92, and you pointed out it was the, his children or his grandchildren mm. that suffered. Would it be stretching that too far that if a child is born um, and is diagnosed with a lethal form of uh, cancer at a very, very tender age, you know, toddler age, that somewhere in the past? Yeah. See, when, it, when a child is born with cancer, that's where you've got to look because they haven't been on the planet long enough. That's right, and it could be in the genes, it could be something the mother was exposed to in pregnancy, it could be a, absolutely, it could be the father too. That's why in Job 29.16, the Bible says that Job says, the cause I knew not, I searched out. The cause I knew not, I searched out. In other words, we should all be private investigators searching out why these things are so. That's right, that's right. There, there is a reason. I don't know the reason. You can hypothesize. Yeah? Whenever I'm not thinking or reflecting, I'm thinking about fungus. There is a remedy for nail fungus, and it's in the little green book up there called Self Heal by Design, <laughs> because the nails are an indication of what's happening inside. And what you can do is put one drop of grapefruit seed extract on the nails every night for a month and then the next month put a drop of tea tree oil on or soak the feet in sodium bicarbonate and water. So there's a few things that you can do. Yes? Well, the best way to get vitamin D, and I'm not familiar with the enzyme you talked about that can stop the vitamin C being utilised. Um, I, I guess you just give the body the right conditions and make sure you have enough sun. But, you know, before you go in the sun, you have to make sure you haven't just been in the shower and washed your body with soap because the sun's rays connect with cholesterol just under the skin. So people who are on cholesterol-lowering medication are going to have trouble getting enough vitamin D. And after you've been in the sun, don't wash your body with soap. You've got to wait two hours. It takes two hours for the vitamin D to be... There's a question up there. Yeah? I'm wondering if it's possible or what steps you can take to get off high blood pressure medication. Um, the doctors won't you off. No, they're right. But tomorrow night, I'm going to target that in detail. So tomorrow night, I think I do diabetes and heart health. So I'll answer that question in detail tomorrow night. Yes? Sorry, say that again. Sauerkraut. 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 Sorry. Sa what does sauerkraut do? Do you find that comfortable? Because I know for us... No, sa sauerkraut can be a great way to maintain the gut flora, but if someone's been on antibiotics, they need more than sauerkraut. They need some high dose of probiotic. Mm -hmm. So probiotic can be used medicinally. I don't take probiotic every day, but if... You know, if I had any of the conditions I explained, I might go on it for a month just to give that boost. Yes? Um, what is your opinion of wheatgrass? What's my opinion of wheatgrass? You're eating the grass, so it's not the wheat. <laughs> and the wheatgrass is very high in chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is one of the most potent blood and tissue cleansers in the body. So wheatgrass is fine. And you had a question? Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis um, 
should not be. And osteoporosis has a hormone factor. You see high estrogen um, gets the progesterone down and progesterone boosts bone building cells. So every, anyone with osteoporosis should go on the Anna's Wild Yam Cream, which will lift the progesterone levels and they boost osteoblast cells, which is your uh, bone building cells, plus resistance training. Yeah, the person should be doing push-ups. The plank, you know the plank? See if you can hold it for a minute. Can't hold it for a minute, build up to it. There's a question up the back. Yes, because the organic wheat sprouting breaks down the sugars, the starch, and one of the starches, I'll show you tomorrow, is one of the problems, and it also breaks down the gluten, and that's the other problem. So if you have just bought a big bag of organic wheat, and this lady here said that she sprouts it, blends it, pours it in the dehydrator to make crackers. Perfect. Yes? Yep. I, I like the taste of it. Yep. How do I, uh, what, what, what's, a, what's an alternative? And one that makes me... Smell uh, it. What? It's like you manage See, what one lady said to me, it just gives me that lift in the morning. Well, I can tell you something that gives a better lift and you won't get the corresponding dump, coal shower. <laughs> and your cold is very cold. Huh? Outside, fresh air, and as I show you tomorrow, a crystal of Celtic salt on the tongue and then a glass of water. And when I look at heart health tomorrow, I'll show you what that does to your energy levels. There was, yeah? There are, there are some alternatives like roasted dandelion root, like uh, we have a Cara Echo. There are quite a few, but they are not coffee. No, I know. And they don't get the, give the lift of coffee. But, you know, that, that's what I say. What, why, why do you need a lift? <laughs> yeah? Um, coal sores. Coal sores. Coal sores. Yes, there is a way to conquer coal sores. There's an amino acid called lysine. And if you take that amino acid, it'll stop a coleslaw developing. So in Australia, we've got a few health, a few health companies uh, making things. In fact, a few of them sell a product called lipsine. And it's basically just lysine. I don't know if anyone has familiar with that. My husband used to get cold sores all the time. I can't even remember the time he had a cold sore. And if he gets a little bit of a tingle, he just throws down on about four Lipsine tablets and it doesn't even develop. It's from the herpes virus. I've never had a cold sore. In fact, if Michael had one, he'd say, don't kiss me, I've got a cold sore. I said, I'm going to kiss you because I won't get it. Yes, yeah? How do you know if you have enough probiotics in your system? What can you say to tell them? Uh, how do you know? Well, forgive me for talking about such things, but what you leave in the toilet should sink. If it floats, you need some more probiotic. Everyone get that? Yeah? Any herbs or foods that can help with hair with hair loss, hair loss. Um, often it's a hormonal imbalance, so you've got to go on the Anna's Wild Yam Cream. Sometimes it can be low iron, and if there's low iron, there is a cure for low iron. It's boosting hydrochloric acid because 
Iron is bound up with food and it needs acid to free it. So many people that are anemic, it's because of low hydrochloric acid. And I wrote down the recipe for the tea that boosts that. And you've got to exercise and get the blood to the brain and stand on your head. If you can't stand on your head, lay over the bed for a while, massage the head. Yes? Yes. Yes? Well, I, I think if there's a problem in the body, it will tell you. So, uh, you know, the eyes work well. The, if people tell you your breath's bad, the, the, there's something not right there. The, you know, if you get hungry within one hour of eating, you're, digest, you're not digesting, you. it's going through, through too fast. Three intakes of food a day should... Th equal three evacuations that are <clears throat> sink. So you, I really think your body tells you if, if, if something's wrong. Because if someone says to me, I've just found out I've got colon cancer, the next thing I say is, what caused you to go to the doctor? Oh, I was getting pain. You see, I take it back, back, back. And, we, and pain is your friend. Pain tells you something's not quite right. So if everything in the body's running well, you're doing well. But I say to people, stop wheat for two months. It's a challenge. And many people at the end of that two months say, I can't believe my energy. My bloating's gone and I didn't realise I just learnt to live with that bloating and I don't get the brain fog anymore. How many people blame it on age? Mm? Our memory should be good. We should not have brain fog. So... I, I understand your question, but I really think that if there's a problem, your body will tell you. Yes? How come we don't destroy it anymore? Is that the, the What is it? Or specifically Ancorn wheat. Ancorn wheat, yeah. Your ancorn is your original wheat. And on Thursday, I'll be giving the story of the different wheats. But it has not, and corn has not been hybridized. It's spelt like this. That's, that's the original wheat, if you can get it. But there is some wild hybrids from that, and it's spelt. And kamut. Yet you can, you can reverse osteoporosis. Don't take calcium supplements, whatever you do. Have you noticed in aged care, all the old people are on calcium supplements and they've all got osteoporosis. Now do the maths. What about vitamin D? Would you recommend that? Or no, just go out in the sun. Bones are made of 12 minerals. They're made of um, boron, calcium, chromium, iron, magnesium, mangazine, silica, sulfur and selenium and potassium and phosphorus and zinc. That's what bones are made of. They're not made of calcium. Calcium hardens cement, does not harden bones. It hardens the tissue. It contributes to atherosclerosis. The Calcium Lie is a book by Dr. Robert Thompson. He says, we go to med school, we learn this. We come out of med school, the blinkers go up. Fozimax? Fozimax. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. And start push-ups. Start plank. Start, start your resistance training. Start building up your muscles. Yes? Okay, the floating. The floating or the sinking in, in the toilet. If it sinks, it's got good bacteria. If it floats, it's because you haven't got a good balance of bacteria, and maybe also you're just eating too fast, so there's, there's a few things. So stools should be 
um, not liquid and not like rabbit pellets. Stools should be mid-brown colour, about the colour of this trimming here. <laughs> Shouldn't be pale. If it's pale, your liver's not happy. If it's black, you might be bleeding further up. See, there's signs. There's signs. If you want to know what it looks like when you go and help your little two-year-old grandson to fix himself after the toilet, have you noticed that his stools are that round? And have you noticed many adult stools are that round? Interesting. So it should have a nice circumference. <laughs> what if you haven't? Go on a, on a healthy diet and little by little you will, you will recover. Yes? Planto Polaris, don't they come up with some interesting names? Do you know, people give me all sorts of interesting names. So I just say, what are the symptoms? And medicine treats symptoms by just silencing them, whereas naturally you treat symptoms because that's where the body's calling out. And if you get relief by treating it naturally, you, you're getting healing. Well, let me give you a really good one. This is fantastic for scalp, and this can be good for the lady with hair loss. Is once a month, get, um, say, four teaspoons of coconut oil and put in about three or four drops of rosemary essential oil. Rosemary essential oil is a specific for scalp and head. Massage it in, wrap it up in a shower cap or something, and leave it there all day. And it's, it's very good for rosemary oil, rosemary essential oil. You'd probably put four drops into four teaspoons of oil. Yes? What do you think of organic goats? What do I think of organic goats? When someone has celiac, they usually can't handle oats. If, and if a person's bloated after every breakfast and I say, what do you eat? And they say oatmeal, I say, try having millet for breakfast. If you're not sure, have millet every day for a week, then have oats every day for a week, and then and see. Can you see how your body's response will tell you what no doctor, no test can tell you? Yes? If someone has a heart disease and has blockage, uh, say 85%, so is that reversible? Heart disease, disease and blockage, we're going to look at detail tomorrow night. Uh, there's only one organ that totally regrows and that's the liver. But I've had people come to me with type 1 diabetes and in four weeks, well in sometimes two and three weeks, that's happened a couple of times, they've reduced their insulin by 90% and they were told their pancreas was dead. I said, is it gangrene? What does dead mean? If there's blood going through it, there is life. One young, and one young man that happened a couple of years ago, he was 20 and he'd had type 1 for five years. And another man that was only a couple of weeks ago when I was at Living Springs in Alabama, he, he was on uh, 40 units of long acting and 40 units of short acting a day. And by the end of the first week, he was on 10 units of short acting once a day. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. So I see when the body's given the right conditions, it responds. Yeah? Well, when we get to heaven, you can ask God. <laughs> but it's the only recoverable organ. Yeah? Prostate. Um, let me see, I can say this quickly. When oestrogen is high, and if you go to my hormone lecture, it'll tell you why it goes high. Testosterone goes high, and when testosterone goes high, 
the body converts testosterone into dehydroxytestosterone and dehydroxytestosterone causes inflammation of the prostate gland. Zinc inhibits that conversion. In fact, Graham Sait, who's quite a well-known speaker on health in Australia, he said if every man over the age of 40 took a zinc supplement every day, no one would get prostate problems. Isn't that interesting? Wow. How do you spell his last name? Graham Sait, S-A-I-T. He basically speaks on health, but he mostly speaks on soil. Because <laughs> if you understand soil, then you understand human health. And there is a herb called saw pimento, S-A-W-P-A-L-M-E-N-T-O. Saw pimento is a herb that reduces the inflammation of the prostate gland. Yes? So given that the question of balance in terms for men with declining testosterone are signs, right? What, what are you using to supplement that given that it is important, right? For vitality, for mood, for... It is. It is. Now the Anna's Wild Yam Cream gets that balance right because progesterone is the key, well it's the precursor for oestrogen, testosterone, the adrenal hormone. So whether man or woman, it boosts it. Um, f forgive, the, forgive the description, but I don't know a, a more diploma diplomatic, diplomatic way of saying it, but I have had some men say that Anna's Wild Yam Cream yam cream puts lead in their pencil. <laughs> Have you got a better way of saying it? <laughs> yeah? Yes, so the question is if someone has a cancer that is estrogen receptive, see estrogen is a cell proliferator and in Australia the Cancer Foundation have is issued a warning that estrogen is a known human carcinogen. So it's very important to get this balance back. And so what they do in Australia is they give tamoxifen to a woman who's... And tamoxifen blocks the estrogen receptor sites, but red clover can do that. Red clover. Red clover. And the best way is to, ta is to supplement it with high doses in a tablet form. But what the person also needs to do is to go on the Anna's Wild Yam Cream, which will boost progesterone and automatically bring estrogen back into a, into a right balance. Yes? Yes, a woman's been on the pill for many years and it's, uh, and when they put the patch in, you know, a, a woman cannot even have a period for, for a year and then it's time to fall pregnant and they have difficulty. So they need to go on the Anna's Wild Yam Cream to get the hormones balanced back. Now the Anna's Wild Yam Cream is made in Australia and Michael and I know that people that, that own, the, it's not even a company, it's just this couple that make the cream, that's it. They, they're not a multinational. And she said to me, there are many babies now called Anna. Because <laughs> of couples who couldn't have the cream. Um, if you go and see my husband, Michael, he can uh, give you our daughter's contact details. details. And she, but um, I don't, I think that you can access on our website too, it tells them. But I want to thank you for sitting so long. <laughs> I should let you go. <laughs>